You know, I think about us, the three of us, what we could be. I think about it all the time. Please, it's terrible. No, it's not. I know Jim. She's my friend. I care about her. How's your day going? You look pretty. Thanks. I wore it just for you. Her father's a driver named Nick. He helped me to survive. Yes, you can, because I can't lose you. I'm not gonna let anything happen to you. What about you? Your girlfriend is a badass. Welcome to Above the Garage, a Nick and June, The Handmaid's Tale podcast. Hey friends, welcome to our deep dive into season one, episode five of The Handmaid's Tale. This episode is called Faithful, and we're going to discuss it in the context of the show to date. So if you're a new watcher, go and find our spoiler-free analysis that we released on Monday of the same episode. This episode is intended for longtime fans to discuss the episode in the context of the show to date. So let's do a round of introductions and dive in. Hi, I'm Wanda. Hi, I'm Mary Gold. Hi, I'm Ginger. I'm Scarlett. And I'm Kate. So for the deep dive, let's start again at the beginning when June and Fred are playing Scrabble and her voiceover tells us this is her 34th game of Scrabble with him and that she's enjoying him letting her win and he is enjoying her flirting with him. So I did not remember June and Fred getting along this well. Uh, even in the beginning, the, the flirtatious tone I'll admit during the first time I watched it, I thought that the show was setting it up to have something build between June and Fred. So I think I do recall back in 2017, probably (laughs) thinking that that was going somewhere that it wasn't. Thank God. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That would have been horrible. (laughs) But it it is accurate in the Stockholm Syndrome kind of way, you know? I mean, you've not been allowed to do anything for many years and now you're, you play Scrabble every night and read magazines and drink alcohol, which is another parallel to the season four finale. I forgot that they used to drink together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Same glasses too. Yeah. Really? Oh, (laughs) yeah. I think they're the same glasses, which would read Dorset glassware from Williams. (laughs) Very specific, Scarlett. (laughs) (laughs) We have an expert on every episode. I really noticed during when Serena is telling June that she's going to have to sleep with Nick when, you know, she says, oh, it's going to be Nick. And the way June says his name, that softness came out. And I immediately thought of 409 when he says her name and, you know, she's so hard in season four and even season three because of what has happened to her. And she's such, she's hard and like stone cold and just traumatized and, Nick is the only person who can bring out that softness in her, you know, and yeah. it's just amazing, like rewatching and seeing that it started from the very beginning that they've always, she's always been soft with him, yeah. like soft in a good way, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, Lizzie did say in, a, in an interview, I think it was in the rap or I forget exactly where, but she did say that June is herself with Nick. She's softer, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you can tell that she wants to be with Nick. Mm-hmm. I think that's why season three, she's so, so detached and so different, you know, like season three is is like her turning point into becoming this ruthless person, like becoming more like Gilead. And I think she has that ability to become that because he's not there. Right. Yeah. That's the way that I, that I kind of see season three. No, I agree. And I think too, like, you know, back to when they're in Fred's office and you know, Fred says, what is, what else is there to live for? And June says, love. I think it's very important because I hear a lot of people say, well, June should be alone. Like she shouldn't be with right. anyone. Mm-hmm. But, oh my God. But, but this episode, she says she wants love. That's what she lives for. Right. So this is what she wants. And then obviously we see at the end of season four, she clearly wants Nick. Right. For a lot of these reasons, because of the way he treats her, you know? And I think, you know, a lot of people like to say she should be alone, which honestly kind of even offends me because I don't think we should be telling a woman who's been like, yeah, everything has been taken away from her for seven years. I don't think we should be telling her how she should feel. Yeah. Um, but I just think it's, I think she, this go, literally goes back to season one where she's saying she wants love. She doesn't want to be alone. Well, she wants- I mean, that scene at the, the um, tr- what is the food truck with Luke? 
it shows mm-hmm. that she wants she was searching for love yeah. at, on a tinder she had a tinder profile so what makes people think that she wants to be alone june, june has never wanted to be alone Mm-mm. not not ever like you said and what's anymore. better than being with somebody who has been there with you through a lot of your trauma you know right yeah like what's better than being with somebody who has seen it and he's been in that war and he understands you and not only does he understand you but like he he can help give, you heal too exactly he gives you that autonomy that you mm-hmm. desperately want and need he he's selfless like and he's seen the worst of you like yeah yeah he's been, you know every the lowest you've been the meanest you've been the murderous yeah. you've been like, yeah. like every well, it's, single it's, aspect of you he loves you it's the only time she can be vulnerable it's the only time she can be herself and it goes again to that flashback of you know then i'll love whoever you become no because no. you expect luke expects june to be somebody else and june feels that she has to fit this mold in order to be loved by by luke she says it on the boat Mm-hmm. She feels like she owes him. And I don't doubt that she cared and she loved him, but it's just not the same love that right. one in a lifetime love, unconditional love, because that's what it is between Nick and June. It's been shown since season one, all the way to season four. So that flashback is really important because, mm-hmm. you know, it's showing Luke saying, I'll love whoever you become, but that's not true. Once we get to 410, we know exactly who's going to love whatever June becomes because he's loved June who she was before, even though she, he didn't know her. He mm-hmm. loves what June was before, loves what June is now, and he's going to love whatever June becomes after because yeah. he loves June, period. I think it was funny because I, you know, rewatching this episode when they're talking about the 10 ways um, to tell how he feels mm-hmm. about you. And in Fred's office, like she reads, he brings you small gifts. And the first thing that popped into my mind was Nick bringing June the gift of Fred. Right. Not a small family. gift. Like, that's like, that's such a good parallel. <laughs> Pretty big gift. Yeah, that's actually yeah. a huge gift. That's my thing with Nick is he always like gives her the best gifts. He Literally does. bringing her messages of her husband's love from Canada. Right. That is mind blowing to me because... Very few people would ever do that. The file on Hannah. Yeah, the file like, on yeah. Hannah. Like, he didn't yeah. even know that he was going to see her again. And he was doing all of this work for her. He's like, yeah. well, she's mm-hmm. gone. What can I do for her well, yeah. she, you know, now that she's gone forever? And exactly. he does it. And then he brings her the gift of her rapist. There you the go. <laughs> I mean, what what better gifts could a woman and her children you know? ask for? Well, literally, there is no better gift that any woman could ever get than her nope. rapist. So it's interesting. He She checks off the only two of the 10 that she got through in that magazine. I'd like to track it down and I'm sure he fulfills the other eight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the intimacy coordinators for season oh, four. Yeah. <laughs> there was no sex scenes. <laughs> I know. Yes, there was. Oh, right. So yeah, the end of season four, episode seven, when June's just finished confronting Serena and she comes back home to Luke. And... Uh, yeah. You guys consider that scene with Luke rape? Yes. I, I, I want to say something. Yeah. If you're seeing it from the outside, yes, he didn't want to, you know, and by yeah. definition, that's what it was. And if I you're can't a really jury, say, well, you're saying yes, correct? Yeah. Yes. If, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't really go say, well, he can push her off because that's going to revert to the times where women don't fight back and then right. they don't get justice. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I mean, we think about it because unfortunately we do, but mm-hmm. in the same sense, if June and Luke don't consider that rape, which they're, they're characters, I know this. Mm-hmm. I don't think they consider that rape themselves. We're looking at it from the outside. Yeah. So we know what it is, but I don't think they think that's what She that considers was. it rape I, because of the voiceover that she said right afterwards. What did she say right afterwards? What did she say? Sorry. I don't know. I don't remember when she's talking like about Serena, Serena. Right? Yeah, and she oh. says she'll rape you or whatever. And it's yeah. showing like June yeah. and Luke at that time. I agree that oh. they, they don't think it's rape. But yeah. the fact that his agency was taken away, that yeah. in itself is is rape. What do you think, think Marigold? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely think it's rape. I mean, and I think the show put it there in order for everybody to talk about it. I mean, yeah. I've read so many things like, well, that's they're married. That's not rape. Uh, yes, it oh, is. Yeah. Uh, if you don't feel that you got raped, it doesn't matter. You know, like you're just going to say that you weren't raped. Yeah, I you agree. Know, even I, if it is. I think it, Matt, you're right. I don't think I just think would it's, say that he was raped. I just yeah. think it's easier for us to accept 
a woman being raped than it is a man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with with domestic violence. We don't Mm -hmm. think men suffer domestic violence, but they do. No, I agree with Marigold. I don't think that Luke would say he was raped. Yeah, I think I think that he probably would have wanted to have sex with June, Mm -hmm. but obviously not not in that way. Like Mm -hmm. I think he wanted it, but then when he realized like how she was going about it, he was she put her hand over his mouth. Like yeah, and she, very, yeah, she pinned like, his hand actually, down. Yeah. She pinned his hand down. She was saying, "Don't touch me." I mean, he wanted to be. He wanted. He was like, "Oh, yeah." He wanted to be involved, but yeah. she said, "No, I don't want you involved." Yeah, yeah and don't I'm touch me, you. and don't talk. You have no say. So that's why. I mean, she took away his agency. That's why I see it as rape. A lot of people think that, like we said earlier, men cannot be victims. I mean, I know this is a feminist show, but just because it's a feminist show doesn't mean that men cannot be allies. How right. do we expect to get equality if we're thinking that the huge problem is all the men or if you don't right. know how to educate the men on what we want or how we feel? This is why I think it gets complicated with the way people like to think that Nick raped June. Yeah. He didn't. But no. again, because because people because don't see the man, man yeah. people that don't see the man as much as a victim as much right. as that. He's an I, but he still has no choice. Right. Um, when when undercover FBI agents go undercover, they have to kill people and they have to do drugs because they have to keep the mask on in order to catch the big fish. And their morality is going to be lost along the way. We haven't seen Nick's morality get lost along right. the way. He is a true ally to all women. And he's mm-hmm. just because June is a feminist and we're all feminists and it's a show about women doesn't mean you can't have a man who supports her like right. she's right. still she's a woman she's a woman but she's still a human like humans want to be loved right so to have somebody support you and like give you that stability and like mental health and all that like that helps her be even more of a stronger woman you know so i had two more observations so when luke and june are in the hotel room and she asks him to leave his wife and then luke says i'm in love with you i that struck me because he said he's in love with her, which to me just doesn't sound the same as I love you. Uh, and I, oh. I, don't, I don't know. I'm trying to remember like if we've heard Luke say, I love you to June or her say it to him in the show. I don't remember. She said but, it to him oh, on the cassette tape and in the letter. They both say it at the christening of Hannah. Okay. okay. But I just think that it, it was struck me as strange like, sounding too, though. That that yeah, is because he said, said I'm it. in love with you, which for Nick and June, they've never said anything but I love you, which right. also they've never even said I love you too, like in the bridge scene yeah. that I love so much. I really appreciate that he doesn't say I love you too, because yeah. I mean, I think that's fine to say, but I think even I love you too comes off different than I love you because I love you too can kind of sound like I'm agreeing with you. I but agree. I think if you both say I love you, it's like it's more state, it's a, it's more powerful. So I thought that was I don't know. That was striking mm-hmm. for me. Me too. And then also one more observation I had too, when they first get, when um, Luke and June first get together and they go to the hotel room, I'm always listening to the background noise in this show. And I give like the sound people major props because all these little details of this show are just so important. You don't really realize it when you first watch it, but when they go to the hotel room to hook up for the first time, there's sirens in the background. <laughs> like emergency sirens and I was like oh my gosh is that is that like even a sign back then like <laughs> the red flag like look there are sirens with this relationship That's abort, really interesting. Abort. <laughs> yeah. that cafe scene was actually a foreshadowing of what's to come because you yeah. see those little those Girl. four little girls in the background and the red mm-hmm. dresses yeah oh mm-hmm. I didn't remember that they were in red I noticed that yeah. too Yep. Oh, yeah. Wow. Handmade red. Mm-hmm. Traveling in pairs. We also wanted to hit again in the deep dive um, that scene after the ceremony in this episode when June goes up to Fred's office to confront him about touching her inappropriately. Well, Gilead inappropriately during the ceremony. And then he um, says that quote that's used a few times in the show. Better never means better for everyone. It always means yeah. worse better. for it some. It always means worse for some. That line goes back to, um, I believe, season two. We were talking about the Boston Globe. And um, Nick tells her that it's it's best for her to leave. And June uses that same line that Fred told her. 
So it was, I didn't catch on to it until I rewatched it last night that that's what Fred tells her. And then she tells Nick in the second season. So there's another well, parallel. Right right. There. Well, Cause she yeah. says she wants to stay for Hannah and Nick says it's better for everyone if she goes. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to their conversation in the kitchen where June asks him if he's an I. Mm-hmm. Um, back again, back to that line where she tells she tells him, "Please don't tell me what to do, or please don't tell me where to go." You know, again, I I mentioned earlier, I think it's such a turning point in their relationship. But from that point on, he never again tells her what to do. And right. again, I think back to the Boston Globe where he just gives her his gun and lets her. He's going to let her drive away because he's not going to, even though we all know, like, she's not rational in that scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's not going to tell her not to go. He just can't do that. That's not who Nick is. And he won't do it. Yeah. She's established the, that boundary early on. And he's never crossed that ever. Never again. Like, what nope. man has ever listened to a woman that? In, I know. Like, he could have easily lied to her about being an I, but he right. was always truthful with her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Never tells her what to do. Like, let it go. We're going to put Fred on the wall. We <laughs> yep. just got to let it go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, like, that, that's absolutely true. Like, that is probably, I think, one of the biggest, yeah, I think it's like the biggest moment in their relationship is what happened in the kitchen. Like Ginger said, he said, you know, go to your room. I'm trying to tell you to be safe. And she's like, do not tell me what to do. You know, you can perhaps advise me, but you cannot tell me what to do. And mm-hmm. I just never seen a person take that so deeply into his soul and, and decide I'm never, ever again, going to tell her what to do, even if it means her life, you know, like we talked about, even in the season four, when he captures her and he could kick the gun away, but he doesn't, he just says, you know, I'm trying to keep you alive. And he stands up and he waits for her to make the decision on whether she's going to live or going to die. With season three, you know, he'd, he'd do anything for her. Season three, she asks him to go talk to the Swiss and he doesn't want to go because he mm-hmm. has his reasons not to go. And yet he still goes. And that like goes forward to, you know, he'll do anything for me and for, for Nicole. I mean, it's, it's been there since, since the beginning. He didn't have to tell her he was an I. That was a death sentence. Yeah. And he tells her because he wants to establish that trust. I mean, there's something there. And I think he he's always been in awe of who June is. I mean, obviously, like I said earlier, June is the main character of the story, but she pulls people to her fire, whether it's good or bad, because obviously, you know, there's going to be consequences, but people naturally follow her. They are drawn to her for whatever reason. You know what else I love about this episode though? You know, I I really feel like this episode shows that even from the beginning, I think it was always written. It just seems very end game that Nick and June Mm -hmm. are going to be together. And I think this episode, there's just so many parallels between like Luke and Nick and, you know, the flashbacks. Yeah. And I just feel like Mm -hmm. there's so many signs that this was always meant to be, you know, Mm -hmm. like they've played up the love triangle for four seasons, but I don't know. I don't, I think, I think, I think even it was from always... season one. It was evident. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. One thing that I really love, and I, I think we may have touched on this in our meta episode, but just that like June is not afraid to fight with Nick either, or like be angry yes. with him. Yeah. Whereas like with Luke, I don't remember a scene where she was ever really like angry or like lets herself really go when when she was talking to um Maura yes. in episode six when mm-hmm. she says um Annie and Luke fight all the time we never fight mm-hmm. I mean that in itself is a red flag because yes. mm-hmm. if you don't fight with your spouse you're always someone is always giving in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so and it's true. usually June yep. that's given and it, it, it's like she tiptoes around him yeah. This is what I need to see in season five, her telling him exactly how she feels about yeah. him being complacent and them not getting out safe. Yeah. And she fights with Nick. She fought she, with him at the yeah. Boston Globe. Yeah. Yeah. She's she fought with him. Well, I don't know if I'd call it a fight, but I mean, she's pushed back on him even in the next episode when she's in his apartment and she's mad about what she didn't say to the Mexican in um, season three. Yeah. He never yeah, then in season goodbye. three and when he's gonna go off to war, like she's right. mad at him. Scarlet, I think you said that he's her safe place to fall. I think 
in one of your posts, I remember, because I had yeah. mentioned that she tiptoes around Luke, but she fights with Nick. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's and and even in Canada, she, she just got to Canada after being fucked up for seven years and she's still trying to make him feel okay yeah. when it should yeah. be the other way around. Right. Um, she's not, she, she doesn't feel comfortable opening herself up. That's why she didn't want him in the testimony. She tells Moira, I know what he can take. Yeah. It's not what he can take. I mean, I know he's had his share of trauma. I mean, he lost his daughter, he lost his wife, but mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. Trauma is no. not a competition. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. everybody, right. but, but it, come on, dude. Like he, he's I, had seven I, I, years I, to work on his trauma though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But he's, he does, he, he hasn't, you know, he, he right. just simply thought that everything was just going to go back to normal, which, which is not a valid reaction, but it's kind of like a normal reaction. Mm -hmm. um, maybe. And I think I said it in one of the podcasts, it's like with COVID, we all think that things are going to go back to the way they were. They're not, you know, right. this is our new normal. Things are always yeah. going to um, be different. Yeah. So, so I think June noticed exactly what love is supposed to be or how you're supposed to be treated. And it's kind of ironic. She found that in Gilead right. because she wouldn't have found it anywhere else. And she, she wouldn't have had to be how she is if it wouldn't have been for Gilead because she wasn't like her mother. You know, she had this, she has this weird relationship with her mom and even her mom tells her you're going to settle. And that's right. the way that I've seen her relationship with Luke is like, you're settling for what society tells you that you should have, mm -hmm. not yeah. what you want. Right. So what she wants is Nick. We can spend hours analyzing this. <laughs> <obviously>. <laughs> uh, but it's an interesting perspective. I think that it's important that they are both in this show. There is a person like Luke who is your average male that's plotting mm -hmm. along kind of sexist, but not like glaringly so but you know when his wife's money gets taken away he's like it's okay I'll take care of you you know it's like he's unintentionally sexist like I don't yes. think Luke has like a malicious intent none but yeah. he's benefited from the patriarchal, patriarchal. society right Gilead even so right whereas so Nick, have, I, Nick did not have any of these benefits in his in his life before Gilead which right. I think is an interesting you know it's it's their backgrounds play a big role in who who these men are right, and how they the treat teenager. Him. He's the teenager. Like, you know, he was like 18, 19 and he gets, you know, he has a bad family, he has no money. He's trying to support his alcoholic brother. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Possibly dad. I forget exactly what's said and what's in my head canon. But anyway, so he's trying to support his family and he is taken in by a group that targets people that are exactly like him and and in a, an actual situation where this would happen in reality that th these are the two like two of many types of people that are in play here right and i think it's really interesting that the show involves both of them and then how they develop from that point forward do you guys remember when luke went to go visit uh fred in in jail in canada Remember yeah, when yeah. he went mm -hmm. and he sits down and he tells Fred that you and I, he, I'm not quoting verbatim, but he's saying, you know, you and I came from good families. We're educated. We're men of faith. I mean, right then that tells you that both of them came up and they have these misogynistic ways or these um, patriarchal ways. Mm -hmm. they, they sort of have the same upbringing, whereas mm -hmm. like you were saying, Nick, Nick didn't. Nick didn't come from anything like that, you know, as far as we know. Yeah. But that right. just reveals that Luke and there's some similarities between Luke and. Um, yeah. That's I, that's a good point. Yeah. I think that like Mary Gold said, I, I don't think Luke does things maliciously. He's not. I mean, if you have to choose between Fred and Luke, obviously I'm going to choose Luke. Right. He, he doesn't. His intention is not to hurt June or to hurt anyone. It's just, he doesn't know better. Like for me, my problem with Luke wasn't that he was unfaithful to his wife. It was just that he was oblivious and ignorant to the things that were happening to his wife because he didn't know any better because they don't affect him. And he didn't have the capacity to look past that and try to put himself in her shoes. Right. And he's overbearing. And these are things that as women, we are told to look past them like when when they're telling us that we need to find a significant other to settle down we're told to look for a provider a protector and a good father and a man can be a great father and still treat his wife like shit 
but that mm-hmm. wife is not going to leave because she's not going to want to leave her kids without a father. Mm-hmm. So the pressure right. is on the woman. When a man is being protective, we're supposed to like, like that because we're made to believe that we need protection. Mm-hmm. And men sometimes do these things. They don't do them on purpose because misogyny is just ingrained in our society. Sometimes we even promote it without even noticing. And, and I think that's what Luke represents. And that's my big problem with Luke. Like since the beginning, since, since I think the third episode, there's a lot of that there. <laughs> Even if like Nick did benefit from that patriarchal society, I think that he recognizes his privilege, you know, and I think that he recognizes that women have been oppressed and he tries to do something about it too. I think he regrets he's it never, very much. I he's think never he's never a mistreated. self-loathing, like guiltful person. He, mm-hmm. He's never mistreated a woman in the show, even with Serena, like yeah, he treats her yeah, with respect. Definitely. Actually, I mean, that look, me. look how Rita talks to him. He's never <laughs> come back at her ever. Yep. Yeah. I think Londa mentioned it when when he's talking to the Marthas in season four. They're not afraid of him. Right. They're not. Oh, they yell at him. him. Yeah. 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 They treat him. Well, like, they're kind of know, disrespectful to him, but mm-hmm. he doesn't care. Well, because he's he's, he's he's one of them, really. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. he's just playing a game. He's just wearing a mask, and they know the true Nick. So, yeah. right. but I think what makes me respect Nick too is that, you know, you talked about protectiveness and that's what we are kind of like trained to look for. And, you know, a lot of times, well, sometimes, you know, in a patriarchal society, men can be protective in a overbearing way, overbearing yeah. way. But I, I think the way Nick is protective, because he is, he is very protective of June, mm-hmm. but it's in such a, I don't know. It's just such a caring way. And it's definitely not overbearing because he's protective of her, but he never, he still lets her make her own decisions, even if they're not good decisions. Right. And I think that's basically he's her support person. Right. You know, which is why she survives Gillis. She tells Luke in season three, like he helped me to survive survive. because he's there for her. Like we talked about in the last episode, like I think he's the difference. And I think it's even with even with all the other handmaids, they don't have a Nick, you know, and she has this man who he's protective of her, but he lets her be her. He sees her. He lets her be a woman with opinions and her own thoughts. And but like he's still looking out for her and trying to help, you know, steer her. You know, he's out behind the scenes doing things, you know, with being an eye and going against Fred or whatever. But I just think that's what makes me draw. I'm drawn to him even more because you just don't see that even in men that are not living in a Gilead society, you know, Mm -hmm. he sees her as an equal. He doesn't see her as a woman and limited by being a woman. She's limited because she's in Gilead and Gilead limits you because you're a woman. He sees her as just June. She's June period. He's nobody else. Yeah. That's, which, what I like about his character. Which I love because the whole theme of season four was freedom. And really, since the very beginning, season one, Nick has always been the one that gives her true freedom. Right. You know, she's living in Gilead and everything's well, take, taken away from her, but her freedom has always been with Nick. Because especially now that she goes to him, to his apartment, like that's their freedom together, you know, which you, you really see in season two once Eden is in the picture. And now they can't go there. They don't have that freedom anymore, you know? So I think he's always represented freedom for her. When it goes back to her quote Mm -hmm. with Fred um, about love. I mean, that's ultimately what saves her this entire four seasons. And in Canada, she was supposed to be free. She isn't really free now until 409, until she sees Nick. Like we get to see June again. And back to Nick and June. I feel sure we want to discuss again the final scene in this episode when June comes to Nick and makes love on her terms, on their terms, voluntarily. You know, I thought back to the Boston Globe scene where that's a very, um, you know, there's a lot of roughness going on in that one. Mm -hmm. And I think even in this scene, you can still sense that roughness between Nick and June because June is like clawing at his back. and. And then when she's on top of him, like his hands are kind of like digging into her skin as well. But then there's also the gentleness because he does hold her hands and he's just like worshiping her and everything. And I think that, you know, that push and then there's that push pull that's always been between them where like 
he starts out on top of her, but then she ends up on top of him. And I think that's always been how their dynamic has been. So I think it's kind of, yeah. yeah, So I think it's cool that you see that in their very first like real love scene together. Like it's always been there. Yeah. And it's, again, I'm tired of me using the word organic, but it's just stunning to me how like without any conversation or visible, I don't know, change, they just know what to do. Mm -hmm. and it's really beautiful it literally always looks like a dance between the two of them it does the song at the end after she goes to nick is i want a little sugar in my bowl by nina yes yeah and it's like the lyrics are perfect i want a little sweetness down in my soul i could stand some loving oh so bad feel so funny i feel so sad i want a little steam on my clothes maybe i could fix things up so they'll go what's the matter daddy come on save my soul anyway she wants a little sugar I like the uh, music choices in this show. That's like perfect for them and for that scene. Okay, so after we finished this recording, I went back to the book to look specifically at the scene between June and Luke after she's lost her job and money, and he says, it's all right, I can take care of you. So that's season one, episode three of the show, because that scene comes up in conversation a lot. Obviously, the moment when she loses her job and money is important in the whole story. And there's just something about it that's always made me uncomfortable that I couldn't quite put my finger on. So I thought maybe uh, we should see how Margaret Atwood wrote that scene between Luke and June. And unsurprisingly, Margaret Atwood's June puts my feelings a lot more eloquently than I ever could. So let me read this excerpt from the book. That night, after I'd lost my job, Luke wanted to make love. Why didn't I want to? Desperation alone should have driven me but I still felt numbed. I could hardly even feel his hands on me. What's the matter, he said. I don't know, I said. We still have, he said, but he didn't go on to say what we still had. It occurred to me that he shouldn't be saying we, since nothing that I knew of had been taken away from him. We still have each other, I said. It was true. Then why did I sound, even to myself, so indifferent? He kissed me then, as if now I'd said that, things could get back to normal. But something had shifted, some balance. I felt shrunken, so that when he put his arms around me, gathering me up, I was small as a doll. I felt love going forward without me. He doesn't mind this, I thought. He doesn't mind it at all. Maybe he even likes it. We are not each other's anymore. Instead, I am his. Unworthy, unjust, untrue. But that is what happened. So Luke, what I want to ask you now, what I need to know is, was I right? Because we never talked about it. By the time I could have done that, I was afraid to. I couldn't afford to lose you. So I think that excerpt is just very relevant to the conversation that we just had in that Margaret Atwood's original work sums Luke up very similarly to what we've been discussing. And the show's done a phenomenal job of bringing that to life. Even, I think, the quote, the part of that where she says, he kissed me then as if now I'd said that things could get back to normal. I feel like that was kind of how he was acting throughout season four, wanting to just pretend everything was back to normal. So anyway, I think the show's done a really great job of uh, keeping true to the book and the characters in the book. So now we're going to launch into my favorite new segment every week, which is our After the Fact with my good friend, Wanda. Welcome, Wanda. Hi, Kate. How are you today? How's your week going? Oh, it's going good. It's luckily a short holiday week, so we're off to a good start with oh, day okay. one being Tuesday. Oh, okay. And I always look forward to our Tuesday night dates, by the way. So. I know. It's fun, right? I don't know all the things you're about to get into, but I wanted to pick up one thing from our... Was it spoiler free? Yes. Anyway, I just want to clarify the fact that I will die on the hill of Serena subtly advising June to seek out Nick further okay. for better chances of insemination. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'm a good friend of yours and I don't want you to die on that hill alone. <laughs> so, so maybe we should ask the audience. Someone come save me at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say her quote though was, uh, let's see, she said, some women can't handle the requirements of their position. They can't do what needs to be done. You understand Uh what I'm saying. You're a smart girl. So I think she's reinforcing the fact that whoever created the Gilead laws was not that intelligent in the quantity of sexual relations during fertility periods. Right. She's saying uh, you and I know that 
it's a numbers game when it's low fertility and you do what you need to what what needs to be done okay she didn't say you know what you shouldn't do because mm-hmm. i don't believe she was talking about the emily situation do anything that needs to be done to get pregnant now that it's not my husband it's not fred anymore that we're talking about <laughs> already made them do it with nick yeah she's visually seen that they're doing this any chance you get go find him and you know <laughs> do the deed <laughs> yes. And by the way, I don't like that. And that's, I don't think that's why she went back to him over and over again by any means. Yeah. I'm just saying, I think that that's what was happening in that conversation. All right. And I'm not going to say what I think I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to let the, the audience see. I think if they go back and listen, they might be able to tell what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part when everybody's like, no. <laughs> Like, are you crazy? There's no or, way she's telling her to do that. For the record, there is one other person on this hill with me, Melissa, out of our group of many people. So <laughs> the so odds t- are not in our favor, but I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's what a lot of us don't want to give that to Serena. So right. yeah. that's why we're so adamant yeah. that you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll I su- see. I support that. Okay. All right. So what did you have for tonight? All right. So we don't have that much this week because you guys were actually very good in episode four. Mm -hmm. So I'm just finishing up uh, a few things with episode three. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is the panel wanted to know what Fred said about Eden's sister. So I'm just going to say what he said. And he said, but Fred asks Eden's dad, you have another daughter. And Eden's dad replies, he has truly blessed us. And then Fred says, make certain she learns from her sister's transgressions. In tragedy lies opportunity, which I think he actually misquoted Einstein, which I think the quote is, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. But of course, <laughs> it's Fred, so... What I don't like about that is that he says that Eden transgressed and she's the most innocent person there. And yeah. she she's her, Nick and June are the only ones that use the Bible correctly, that quotes right. the Bible. Right. So um, I, that whole thing was a, a tragedy, but uh, that that's what he said. I can't get restarted on that, but it, I know there's another daughter that is being persuaded by the wrong people. Right. So the next thing we have is... A panel member mentions that June talks about love in every season. And she was right. She just said that June told Luke that Holly was born out of love in season two, when that actually happened in season three, episode five, The Unknown Caller. So that was, she was partially right. And then the next thing we have is the aunt's authority. Oh, that's interesting. The question that the panel wanted to know was, why didn't the Guardian stop Maura? Remember when Maura and June were escaping from the Red Center? Yeah, when they walked out of the Red Center. I wondered that, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, it's because the ants have full authority, unbridled authority over the handmaids. Their power is sort of comparable to the commanders, if you think about it. They're, They're the only ones other than the commanders that can read or write in Gilead. That in itself is powerful, right? But uh, I wanted to look at where, what seasons you can see their power displayed. In episode 10 of season one, when June and the other handmaids refuse to stone Janine, a guardian points the weapon at June and Aunt Lydia yells at him, no, these girls are my responsibility. Oh, yeah. And then in episode two of season three, Aunt Lydia cattle prods June and Lawrence does nothing. Remember when Lawrence is sick? (laughs) He just lets her get away with it. And then episode four of that same season, season three, Aunt Lydia beats Janine in a room full of commanders and they do nothing. Hmm. And then in episode one of season four, Aunt Lydia comes before the commander's council and is told that she's not going to receive any any punishment any longer. And Calhoun says to her, this is not an exoneration. Those children were taken by females under your charge. And then in episode eight of season four, Aunt Lydia is told by Lawrence that Janine had been 
captured in Chicago. And Lawrence says the trouble that she has caused and the defiance is such a poor reflection on your training on Gilead. And Aunt Lydia says, yes, Commander, I assure you that this girl was led astray trying to blame June. Mm -hmm. But then Lawrence says, this girl was your responsibility. In other words, Aunt Lydia, the buck stops with you. Yes. So, but um, oh, those are really good. That's interesting. Yeah. And the last thing we have, which this is a doozy. Okay. So can the commanders have sex with their wives for other than procreation reasons? Right. So after the two years, right? Because I think they have two years until they get a handmaid. Right. And I'm very curious too. After that point, are they supposed to do tech? They are. Yeah. They are allowed to have sex with their wife. There's no limitation on their, you know, when they can have sex, the limitation is only on the handmaids and the commander's relationship because the commander and the handmaids are only supposed to have sex for procreation reasons, not the wives. And I have proof. That's fascinating. I always thought they weren't supposed to. So no, no, I don't know why people, when this is a theocracy, I know, it you know, make any sense. it I doesn't know. right. So, Okay. So th let's look at what the Bible says. We know that uh, Gilead appropriates or misuses the Bible, but it's still considered a theocracy, right? Yes. Okay. So also keep in mind that the relationships in Gilead have been altered, undermined, and in many ways forbidden. That's what makes Nick and June's love of hair so fascinating to us because it survived all of that adversity, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So let's look at what the Bible says about marriage. Okay, so we're going to look at Hebrews 13 and 4. And it states that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And that undefiled means it's uncontaminated. The marrow and, bed? Uh, yeah, the marrow bed is uncontaminated. In other words, the sexual intimacy shared between a husband and wife is to be reserved for that couple alone. God created the sexual union to be between a husband and a wife, period. No other use of sexuality is ever condoned in scripture. To abuse or misuse God's gift of sex is to defile the marriage bed. So that's what God says about it. So let's look at the proof that Gilead, that they're allowed to have sex in Gilead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Season one, episode nine, Janine and Putnam. Hmm. Putnam says in response to Janine, Janine's ex accusations, she's not well. And then she says, I was well enough to suck your cock. <laughs> <laughs> this is on the bridge, right? I don't yeah. <laughs> then she says, I did every fucked up thing you wanted. All the freaky shit that she'd never do. So yeah, that's proof that they're having sex. Yeah. And then season four, Two episode five, Serena is talking to the newly married Eden, and she says, did your mother tell you what to expect tonight when you lie with him? Mm. Uh, and then she says, it's your duty to bear children. That's one of, that's one of the things that's her duty. But also, and this, this is Serena saying, but also let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. And Eden says, I don't understand. And Serena says, the act, she's talking about the sexual act, mm -hmm. lying together, it can feel wonderful for you as well as him. And then Eden says, but it's lust, but lust is a sin. And Serena says, not between husband and wife. It can bring you closer together. It should anyway. And then episode 10 of season two, Commander Horace gets his wife pregnant and he's promoted because of it. Right. They're very excited. Yeah. Yep. So that's it. All right. Well, this has been fascinating as always. <laughs> and thanks for doing all the hard work. I, um, I don't know how, what your process is like, but thank you for putting in. You're welcome. I guess we'll take a break next week because you don't have anything. That is correct. We, audience, are working on a special project for next right. week that right. should come out on Wednesday. So we're going to take a mid-season break from our rewatch and resume that the following week. Okay. But do watch out on Wednesday for something that we are very excited about. All righty. 
then I guess that is a wrap on our deep dive into season one, episode five of The Handmaid's Tale. We will see you next Wednesday for our special project and the following week to rewatch season one, episode six. You know, I think about us, the three of us, what we could be. I think about it all the time. Please, it's terrible. No, it's not. I know Jim, she's my friend. I care about her. How's your day going? You look pretty. Thanks. I wore it just for you. Her father's a driver named Nick. He helped me to survive. Yes, you can, because I can't lose you. I'm not gonna let anything happen to you. What about you? Your girlfriend is a badass. 